lives and livelihoods. So I really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, and it's really important to know that we are going to try and do this through the hour that we've allocated for it, because I understand everybody has a lot of other things to do. We're also going to try and focus us on solutions, but I think in order to get to that point, we need to be really clear on what the issues are. So if we can very quickly, because it would be really useful to know who's in the room, quickly just say your name and where you're from, whether that's as an organisation, or whether you're a body court manager, or you're you know, a property owner, or otherwise, that would be really useful. So, if I mess up with you, we'll just go around. Yes, Richard Wong, I'm a resident at Fury One. So, I'm back and uh, also a resident at Fury One. Thank you. Thank you. Here we are, I'm a member of Fury One. Thank you. 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 Glenn Ruddock, BC Chair for Silo. I own several buildings around town and been in a very problematic building until recently. Hi, I'm Karen Blanco, I'm with Crocker's um, Body Court Manager. Bill, you're my Body Court Chair for Harvard and from Greelgar. Hudson Postage, I'm owner of Harvard and Robson. I'm Alan, I'm a Body Court Manager for Barton and Robson. I'm doing this I'm like, I'm uh, from Union and Co. I'm a Union and Co. Kia ora, I'm Jane Kukulaya, I'm Lifewise Analyst. Awesome, thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Elliot, I'm the Group Property Manager for Social Housing at Edda Property Trust. Thank you. Hi, hi everybody, I'm uh, Peter from Lifewise, I'm a community service manager. I'm Matthew, Building Manager at the Department. Robin, Building Manager, Property Manager, uh, yeah, the Chairman of the uh, and I'm the um, building manager at Stanford. Uh, Rob, building manager at the Chief Department. Wendy, body corporate manager. Kareem, body corporate manager for Property 101. Simon, body corp, uh, the silo apartments. Uh, Blessy, building manager for the Winston Presidences. Uh, Lee Brown, building manager for the Winston Presidences. I'm Peter at Q Central Apartments with 317 apartments, uh, some 60 of them are social housing. Affecting 
other tenants and other owners that are living next to them. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say one example, which is probably an extreme. Do you can yeah. we ask you to stand up? Okay. One example, which is an extreme, we had, um, it wasn't so much social housing, but it was a WINS tenant with issues that um, had so much violence, it was $12,000 worth of damage done, blood fighting, um, a guy smashed, one of his friends smashed windows over other tenants and other apartments. Um, he was bleeding all over and a six-year-old actually had to walk out through where the blood was, you know, from mm. the next door neighbour's family. That's an extreme. Mm. But it's just safety, like people getting threatened. I've been mm -hmm. threatened probably five, six times in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it's just before anything bad happens, try to put in place a system that, mm. um, that allows prompt and proper responses mm -hmm. to it. And it's very hard to get anyone, apart from the police, which yeah. do a wonderful job, um, to come along and um, but they're not really the group, I believe, that should be doing it. Because if an owner has a problem tenant, you go to the owner, and it's very hard to generally get hold of the social workers, etc., that are required for these type of people, for mm -hmm. these people. That's an we're not all part. Yeah, so well, I mean, with regards to that. Yeah, but you know, to to continue with I guess the common definition and then the inverse of that being yeah. attempted a solution for it. Yeah. But what if you say that press issue is those who are manifesting or producing the majority of these issues are not able to end up being rehoused, or is it something else? Well they need support around them. They need that support. Yeah. And it's not the support that I think most of us feel um, that like I've been advised, whether it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. that one social worker might have 10 clients mm -hmm. that see them for one to three hours a, a week. Mm -hmm. Is that satisfactory for someone that's got made like potentially? There are some that are really good and they fit in straight away and there's others that seem to be pushed from one building to another because building managers feed yeah. and they just get moved from here to here to here to here mm -hmm. and it's no good just moving a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the interaction that you're having with the has anybody had experience in trying to get people help or whatever else with touching base with another NGO or entity? And what's that experience been? We've had, um, we've had armed police with assault rifles in our uh, immediate vicinity attempting to arrest social housing tenants. Uh, in that sort of circumstance, I'm not exactly certain how we would go about engaging an NGO to resolve the issue. Mm. Yeah. But that's, that's the thing, right? Yeah. I'm saying there's a pointy end of the problem, which is when the police can respond and they evidently do, but then there's all of the other, yeah. for lack of a better term, not as severe issues yeah. where people are being bounced from place to place. Um, it's just my thought, and I've written in the stand and all that, but in some ways, I think the social housing or whoever's giving support to these groups needs to assess these people mm -hmm. and and then appropriate them to suitable mm -hmm. accommodation. Because we do have the odd ones that come through that are fine, not a problem and all that. But it's no good, from my point of view anyway, people going in there that um, don't can't handle living next to all others or want to bring in all their friends and their big parties that are drunk abusive, young, swearing and all that, they need to be assessed and whether it be that, and I know from what I've heard from some government departments, they don't want to have what they call slums or whatever or anyone being put into there, but at a certain level someone has to be put in a group that maybe you have the bottom floor with all your social, social housing support people and those people are in that environment until they are at a stage that they are able to work together with other people outside of that environment. Um, may I ask, I mean, likewise, or if you know, what is the process that you go through when trying to get people with housing? You know, how can we start to mitigate that state of things? Um, have you been involved in any of these activities? Yeah, they have. Yeah. So good, and honestly, they're pretty good. Yes. So, 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 so yeah, I mean, I can tell you our approach. So, um, I've worked for Lifewise, so uh, we have people previously so people go through a referral process and an assessment. Um, the support that we provide is, as you say, you know, is that social work support. People that are really in recovery from being homeless, really unwell, physically and mentally. And that pathway to become well is pretty complex. 
I think, you know, whereas we're supported to provide some housing support, what we lack is the mental health resources, the crisis response, the complex health response. None of that, you know, a superman couldn't do that job, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, look, I think we, uh, so, so there is an assessment process. People work through a recovery plan. That's tough. Where it's not working out, we use the Tenancy Act to move people on to you know, a better situation. The fact of the matter is, there isn't a better situation. Yeah. We've got, we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people staying in motel accommodation. We're, as a nation, we're spending a million dollars a week on a, a day. Thank you. So that, that's not okay. And I, I'm not saying that, that social tenants in uh, private stock is the answer either. What we need to develop is a range of solutions which make the broadness of people's needs. Some of you all know that Mission are building a big place on Hobson Street, which will have that 24 7 staffing, that on call staff. That's going to be one uh, housing opportunity which I think will work well for some of the um, tenants that you know, really, really struggle to maintain a tenancy in, in a general needs population. Um, but it, it's, it's complex, right? If there was an easy answer to it, we'd have got there by now. Yeah, well, when you take one of these disadvantaged people, and if your role is that somebody dropped them into a building and they think that they'll survive, it doesn't work particularly well. You might, it might be easier to have a young family on one side, some mothers and students on the other side, and they're bringing their ruckus and their, their, their behaviours into the building. And that is disruptive. I can think of straight away of three solid lots of tenants that have moved out of one particular building because of the social housing tenants that are coming into the building. And that's, that's, that's ruining the thing. So, so here, oh, here are we talking about all tenants who are going into social housing? Are we talking about the few? Oh, you, okay. The majority. The majority. The majority, of the majority definitely. Let's say 50 plus. But they haven't got... No, sorry, but the ones who have some problems. Yeah, yeah, 50%. Okay, 50%. It's a large It's the actual tenants' yeah. dreams that people yeah. 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 along yeah. too. Yeah. Um, they're usually ones that do the damage. Mm -hmm. so, you know, they go in the three three ways and that, and they, they damage the cars, they, they, they damage the lifts, they, they leave a mess. Has anyone had any, sorry, Jen, mm -hmm. has anyone had any um, experiences with tenants that have been in the and yeah. you're trespassing and haven't yeah. had work with them? Um, you don't have the right to trespass. Well, we yeah. Yeah. I think Altitude has a trespass policy. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is actually displayed on the lobby. If you tailgate your trespass, and yeah. yeah. it's actually between somebody who's tagging a loss and the yeah. main. But yeah. I'll, I'll just jump in since I'm the building manager at Altitude. Would you either way? Yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, so it's not actually enforceable and there's a lot of ways to get around it. So even if a, we trespass a, someone for you know, threatening behaviour, if they were a visitor, that tenant could still walk them through the building. Um, you do speak with the police about yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, Georgia, are you able to give any insight into what that process looks like right now? Or is that something you need to go over and trespassing? Yeah, trespassing folks who are course that That's nonsense. Uh, that is well, absolute well, nonsense. No, just, just, no, very quickly, okay. no, so just, she is correct, but what I was just trying to say, who has the right to trespass mm. so and so it's so the best that's, officer go, and yeah, you know, she said that's what I mean. Yeah. The body corporate is, is functioning on behalf of all, of the, all the unit holders, yeah. and I think it's absolutely correct, and, and, um, and therefore they can invite that person back. So the question I've got, which I, I think is more of a point, is you can't trespass a tenant if a tenant, tenant has been placed to their property because then they've got nowhere to go. But you can, in my mind, quite, quite lawfully, as a BC, under your rules, which are in, in, on your title, say you breach the rules once, twice, three times, you can't be in this building for two years until we put you in. 
So who enforces that? Because so, to so the how building does have 24 hour how security is a huge cost to the body corporate. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what we're going to do in our view? Is if owners are being indiscriminate on who what tenants they're getting in, it's no reflection on LifeWise or any other NGO. If they're being indiscriminate on what tenants they're getting or the a maximum allowable level of social housing tenants in a high density high rise property, then the owners will pay for the cost of the security guard to administer the trespass. So that's how we're doing. So we've only got uh, 40 odd minutes. Just, just as an example, I have difficulty with those today. Now, I mean, it's Any damage, any 
excesses on insurance. Mm. They get an apartment redone to almost new at the end of a lease that an owner, so that, that's making money, that's an investor, if you see an investor, <laughs> versus an owner that's trying to struggle to keep their tenants in there because their next door neighbour has been disruptive. Mm, and, and, off, and one of the buildings that he's on our committee, his tenant threatened to take him to tenancy to break her tenancy with the owner because of the next door neighbour causing all the problems. Mm. It's the next next of neighbours that are grossly affected by mm. all these bad tenants that these people yeah. um, supply. Mm. There's no consideration. These units, especially in our building, the walls are thin between the, the units. They're not made for, for to have noise, noisy tenants, mm. what? or disruptive tenants. One, one, and we have eight people are affected by one bad tenant coming in. Yeah, exactly. So you're effectively eight owners going to lose good tenants. Mm. And we have our te the tenants pleading to the owners to do something. Mm. You've got owners who cannot do a darn thing. Mm. Or it takes three months. Really? <laughs> so they've got to put up a problem for three months. Yeah, which is, the process takes too long. Really, the yeah. process has to be brought down into a, a very finite period. Um, one of the things that I sort of said was something along the line of the Housing New Zealand has a policing group that go out and say, see, see all the evidence and make a quick decision, not mm. this such a long you know, I'm not saying that's a perfect way and it will never happen, but it, it, it's, it takes too long to go through that process. Mm. May I ask you know, what the process presently is and how you currently deal with these kinds of things? Before I answer that, yep. I've heard a lot here about social tenants and how terrible they are. Maybe not all, somebody said 50%. We've got 65,000 social tenants across the country. Most of these people will be invisible to you because they don't have the news, they're not the people you're talking about here today that are bad. So I just want to bring some context in. The vast majority of people in the social housing home have a need for support. They're not bad people. And what the people you're talking about here are a very small percentage of our tenants, if in fact they are green or tearing tenants. We've had social housing in the CBT since the 1940s, 50s. Today we have in mixed ownership developments, we have something like 450 tenants across 32 buildings, of which there are about 4,500 uh, 4, tenancies in total. So we have probably 10%, in most cases less, of the tenancies in those 32 buildings of which many of you here represent. I just wanted to give you some, uh, I'm asking you to have some context. Social housing tenants are people that, or it could, for the, the one of God, be you or me that's fallen on hard times, might have a health issue, might experience mental health issues. You've got to be careful when you say social housing tenants are bad, and that's what I'm hearing a lot of. Most of our social housing tenants are good people. So just want to have some context there. Um, and our process in terms of... Yeah, so... Um, maybe I'll start, I'll be quick, replacement. Um, to get a social house, you go to the MSD, Ministry of Social Development, you get assessed on a range of criteria, they give you a rating. Um, we're mandated to house from the highest rating down. So if the property comes available, say at Peters, City Road, we get the A20, they're not suitable or they don't want it, then we go down, down, down until someone is. Um, so what you're finding is you're getting people with the most need getting housed first. So um, that most need could be a mum and a child, or it could be someone living in a um, you know, cardboard box down the road. It could be a whole range of things. That person could have alcohol um, dependency challenges, or they could have mental health, or they could relatively be okay in terms of their social um, dynamics. So you just don't know. We do an assessment. MSD does the assessment. Then we do a pre-placement interview. We'll interview them and say, do you have any gang affiliations, drug and alcohol, all that sort of stuff. They'll give us a bit of a history, and then we'll say, okay, we've got these six units, they might be suitable for two of them. Um, in a city, living is not for everyone, as you're aware, it's, it's, it's dense. Um, so some people just don't cope, but what you find is some people who need a, help, a, a home, so you're, you're a mum and a, ch a child, you need a home, and you get offered a property in the city, you might not want to live in the city, you might not have any support in the city, but you don't have a home, you're going to accept it. 
So I guess standing here, we can't speak because we don't come from the background that some of these families do. And so we don't know the, the dire straits that some of them will come from. Some of them do have family harm challenges that they don't have control over. So we've got to be aware of the overall system. So what we do is once we place them, and sometimes, most of the times we get it right, sometimes we don't, and then they go into a home, uh, there's some issues that start appearing, then we might engage with a LifeWise, Auckland City Mission, DHBs, Taylor Centres, and we'll bring the customer in, so we'll talk to them, we'll meet with them, we'll try to refer them to a sustaining centre provider. What we have moved away from is shifting, or lifting and shifting, where we're just moving a challenge somewhere else. Uh, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in addressing the actual underlying challenge of the family or the person. And so what that means is it takes a bit of time to actually understand the situation, what some of their drivers is in a city where they should be living. If not, let's move them to um, a situation outside of the city. So for example, we've had a case in the city where um, this person was causing considerable amount of damage and, and all that sort of stuff with the associates tailgating, all that sort of thing. We moved them out of the body corporate, out of um, mixed ownership into a standalone property. Don't hear from them ever again. They're fine. So it's just a matter of placement sometimes. Sometimes they, the challenge will go with them and then we have to navigate that. So that's sort of where we're at. But we all work with the police. We we'll work with basically anyone who will work with us. Um, but you're right, some of these people do come with a lot of um, challenges and lived experiences that don't just get addressed overnight. So if I can ask, does your experience marry with, because I completely take on board the point that, and I think most people have acknowledged the fact that there are, you know, a lot of people come with a lot of that baggage and, you know, life experience, which is harrowing and needs all of that support. But I think what we're hearing is that there is a small group of people who are causing substantive issues, which actually may have fallen effects to cause other issues for other social so what is currently the process and is there one uh, for the likes of the kind of enforcement of tenancy standards or if there are issues? Um, I mean, could these people come to you? How, how does that actually work? How do you break down that bureaucratic wall? So we, get, we can get complaints from anyone. You can call the owner under number, you can open up the um, quarries line, mm -hmm. and then the tenancy manager will address it with the complainant. Most of the times they're anonymous. You're right, people don't want to complain. If they're anonymous, we can't follow you up. We can't address the complaint. We got the initial complaint. We talk to the customer. They say, "No, that's not right." Mm -hmm. And then there's no recourse because does the complainant have to come from within that building? No, and so and, and also there's a, a misconception. We just because you're not anonymous, someone talked about privacy. I would like you to all complain not anonymously because due to privacy, we're not going to release your details anyway. But it means we can then have a conversation with you and follow it up effectively. Mm -hmm. We can't do our jobs if we don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to share the information with other people and we're also not going to share their information with you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make that very clear. I'm not going to talk about a customer or a, or a tenant of ours with anyone in this room because mm -hmm. that's not your information, just as the information you share with me is not theirs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll go to yourself and then here and then you can get off. It's the most cute, right? Yes, yes. Um, excuse me standing up. I'm just going to slowly for the moment. Andrew and I work very, very closely together. I've got 317 apartments, 60, just over 60 on the mark, trying to raw customers as they now choose to call them. Um, and I would agree with the comment made earlier that it's a very small percentage of those going to raw tenants that cause the grief. My concern is with the comment that Andrew makes about the lifting and shifting of that expression that you've chosen to use. It's the grief that gets caused within the apartment complex. So I've got 90 apartments in one town, I've got 22 buildings in total, but specifically that high density accommodation. It's the grief that that one tenant will cause. And there is clearly a reluctance and supported by the comment that Andrew has made that he doesn't want to know about the, well, not, not Andrew, you personally, I don't think that. I kind of not sympathetic, but don't even want to go near the lifting and shifting approach. I'm wanting that individual that's causing all the heartache and grief and having a negative impact on, say, 10 people, 10 apartments on that same level. I'm wanting that person moved out quite quickly when it's clearly seen what the grief is that they're causing, the negative impacts they're causing, forgetting about the damage that might be done within the apartment, the interim apartment stuff. 
I'm talking about outside that department, the overall complex, and there is clearly a reluctance by Kauai Garoa to move those people. And I know that I've spoken to some of them and I've spoken to other tenants, they've actually been relocated from other properties to this high density accommodation where they are clearly not suited to be accommodated. I want those people moved quickly when it's quite evident the grief they are causing to the community. Is there presently? Do you do that? Is there any way to do that when it is? Because it sounds to be a very small group of people being very You've got to you've got to base everything on facts and so in terms of there needs to be the police of course, there needs to be the noise control. But then we are going to act just because you tell us this person's a problem and you need to move them. We have had cases where building managers or body corporates have acted towards our customers that have been uh, discriminatory and so we're not interested in that either. So we need to deal in the facts. And so if there are no police reports, there are no noise control reports, is there a problem? There might be, but unless there's some evidence, then we need to address it. Once the evidence is there, we can then meet with the customer. If they are happy to move, we can move them basically straight away. If they're not, then we need to go to the No, no, I'm saying, though, I'm saying if they are happy to move, we can do it straight away. But if they're not, there's legal requirements for us as a landlord that have to, we have to follow. So if we're going to issue a 90 day notice or a, you know, a, a quick termination, because we are going to rehouse them, we don't make people homeless, we need to do that. And then we go to tribunal and they say, oh, where's your evidence? Like, building manager says there are problems. Where's the police reports? Where's the noise control reports? No, it's not going to be I think you would agree with what Ken Ken Kratos is. The personal side, but you, you and I have been very, very yeah. constructive in <coughs> what we've been wanting to which achieve. Is, which is why we prefer to work with the building manager, because we get better results than going down the legal route where it. Absolutely, and it sounds here as well as though a real clarity in the process is necessary to be distributed so that everybody understands exactly what weight of evidence you require in order to do that as a baseline starting point. Yeah. Sorry, we've got yourself and then over here, um, yeah. and then yourself, but we uh, also need to touch through, unless everybody is feeling as though all of these points are being valid, but we will get to the point of explicitly focusing on solutions in the final 15 minutes. But uh, apartment style buildings for social housing, whether that is appropriate, I'm hearing that in some cases it does appear to be. Uh, noise control, um, urgently removing violent tenants and wraparound support, and then crime and most common offences. So. I was just going to say, uh, there's a case where Kangaroo just haven't done their job, even though we've been very plain about who we are and what our concerns are. One of their clients was walking around the um, walkway for the Tomahawk looking for his um, ex wife's new boyfriend or something. Mm -hmm. Another time he's wandering, wandering around with a, with, a, with a carving knife on the walk, walkway. Mm -hmm. And on a third occasion, um, there were inspections for uh, firearms for this, mm -hmm. in, his, um, uh, in his particular apartment with the rest of the board, and he had a, uh, a large knife on his back while personnel were in the building. And uh, people have been personally threatened, uh, concerned, alarmed. Um, We've made all this information plain to them, and um, they've done absolutely nothing on that particular case. So it's, it's in which you call the police? Yes, we have. So, yeah. so yes, yes, we have. Yeah. Yes, we have. What was the response to the police in that situation? Well, they couldn't take him away because it was, um, it was he, owned a, he owned a knife or something. They weren't going to take it off. There's some ludicrous experience. Uh, and with regard to those individual experiences, we are more than happy from our office to look into them, and if complaints are needed to be levied against certain entities or organisations, we are more than happy to follow that process with you. Yeah. But I guess the point here is how do we produce a better system or process in order to... I completely understand that there are really egregious examples. I mean, we've done really awful things. They've got to locate them, yeah. We need to get rid of them. We don't care where they go, because they actually can't function in that sort of organisation. If you're not in your building, they might be in their building. Yeah, well, they've got to find somewhere building. else where they can function or where they can be assisted. But if they're disrupting other people and they're moving out. I, I hear what you're saying, but yeah. I also say that, you know, I also deal quite substantially with issues of homelessness in this area, and that's another big issue. Yeah. So we really have to think about this in terms of complex systems and how would you prefer that this kind of behaviour was happening where potentially somebody can get support in their house and that then potentially leads to better outcomes? or where they're potentially on the street and that leads to escalation of that problem. 
So, well, so just, just a bit of solution where there's a, a voluntary agreement made between social health providers and VCs for a maximum number of tenancies that can be conveyed in the building. And if they're too many, a single policy that winds them down to a point. Because no one's going to say we don't want social health tenancy. Probably anyone in this book is going to say that. What I think they're saying is there's a maximum permissible amount of harms that you can endure as a body corporate before you start getting owners ringing you up saying, my tenants leave, etc. Yeah. So is that, a, is that possible? My understanding is that within 24 hours, those are actually absent. That's understanding. Mm -hmm. And for the second, that's the evidence. Mm -hmm. I've seen that a tenant for use for now because it allows you to have two police reports mm -hmm. and had maybe 15 minutes over seven videos of camera footage. Mm -hmm. And then it's thrown out. Going back to the noise control reports, I hold noise for a lot of times and you can tell us the living manager wants a bit. So we get in the trouble because they won't match. So you need to get it to because they won't match. It's not what's the thing. They talk generally. Yeah. They tend to do it as a council. Yeah. They don't want to be involved in the RTA Act. Yeah. And I've even had one or two noise controls that people say things like, oh, when can I pull over? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you're not going to pull over. Yeah. 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 Okay. Everybody's comfortable with that? No one is uncomfortable? Okay, cool. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 I personally know of at least 10 to 20 other tenants who moved out of the building simply due to that one person. And that person then brought in other of their friends into the building. And it's a growing problem because the bigger the social housing population is, the more fleeing you get from the building because of the drug and the violence issues and intimidation. Um, and I fully agree, social housing has to happen. It has to happen, we have to help people. But I think we've got to be a lot more careful in the assessment of the people that we put in the high density buildings because of the sheer volume of people that they affect by their behaviour. And no, is there a better example than this, for example? That's the way. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's, that's where people need, you know, that people need substantial background support yep. and that assessment. Yeah, um, that's actually what I wanted to, to raise. Mm -hmm. We're fighting fires with all of this, how are we going to remove and how are we going to solve? Yep. The problem comes down to, you, in the first place, doing the assessment of what type of body corporate it is and what type of social housing tenant you're going to put in. Because it seems to me, and being a body corporate manager for 16 years, that the wrong type of tenants are going into the wrong complexes. For instance, young families or drug or um, mental health people going into student accommodation or into other accommodation that's just not suitable because trying to fight the fire after they're in, is, as everyone knows, it's extremely difficult. The Unit Titles Act, the RTA, make it very, very difficult for an owner to actually get rid of a tenant. You've got to sort it at the front end by making sure that the people going into the complexes are actually suitable for the next So there's a bunch of different that we do people, but it seems to me that all high people are going to run concerts, and that mismatch is what's causing a lot of the, the problems that you're now retrospectively trying to solve. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to solve it at the front end, not the back end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
it's all flat and the sea in the past year or so? Uh, no, we'll find out. We've only talked about that figure of 450 tenants. There's only mixed, mixed ownership buildings across the yeah. CBD. That number has not increased markedly over the last 10 years because a lot of these properties were acquired in the 2000s. Yeah. We were the owner. Yeah, but we can give it a rather. We don't think you're going to sit there. So, social housing agencies have sprung up like mushrooms. Yeah, no, they're better. Sorry, can I just make a question? Yeah. I think it's a bit hard to get a bang on a kind of world because there are other social health providers. Yeah, we just heard from one, so Egon, case in point. So, I think it's a bit harsh. There are other social health providers. And what we've found is the property managers don't want to take ownership. Mm -hmm. And so the property managers aren't managing the tenant selection, mm -hmm. the owners are indifferent, and we, in a tri uh, between a triangle of the DC and the owners, which are a direct relationship, the property managers and the owners, which is a direct relationship. Mm -hmm. So a body corporate is once removed mm -hmm. from a property manager mm -hmm. via the visa <coughs> owner, and that complicates and makes the communication and the ownership of the issues mm -hmm. much more difficult. Right. Um, yeah, just I just would, I've got a few questions. Like, so when someone goes in um, to a building, is the building manager always notified? Because the thing I'm hearing a lot of the time is the building manager doesn't know, and then they know when something goes wrong. The first right. time they know about it is when something goes wrong. Yep. So that's a big fail because I think that's like disrespectful to the building manager and the owners and tenants in there. The second thing is, if something does go wrong. Who, who do they call? I know you have 0800 numbers, but these things happen after hours. This is 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. Who comes in? The police don't have enough resources. I mean, it's just a conversation we have all the time in the city about this. Um, we report things. It never gets followed up with, you know, it's just, it doesn't, what it feels like is you put them in there and then you just leave it. That's, that's honestly what it feels like. My friends are all first time buyers who bought in the city. We've all bought in the last 10 years. This is where everyone can afford. This is not what. This is not okay. You know, my my friends, what like my the male partners don't want their wives going down outside after seven p.m. There's drug dealing, violence. Mailboxes are getting raided like three or four times a week. You know, it's yeah. like it's actually really terrifying. And you would say that that's occurred in greater prevalence. Yeah, I'm sorry. Last two years, a year and a half. Three, four, four. A young person who grew up here that's left my home. So I find it really difficult. Like the people that I'm sorry, the people that are coming in now, they may be in need, but they are, a lot of them are criminals. Like they honestly yep. are. They're committing crime. Yep. It's a different sort of person coming in now. And they're getting this place in, a, in an area where they have no family, that it's not right, like it's not right. The, the dairy is expensive, they can't actually afford to buy food in your immediate area. It just feels all wrong. And I So that, that comes down to kind of assessment. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just conscious. So uh, what we'll do is the anybody will just run through this because we've got 15, 20 odd minutes left. So um, the use of apartments itself built into social housing, I feel as though we've largely addressed that. There's been points raised which we've noted down with regard to BC kind of rules uh, and also the need for greater and better assessment. Is there anything else anybody wants to say on that? Okay, so what's the relationship? Sorry, the student and then yourself. I yeah. just really have a question. Um, licensing, um, granting licenses instead of leases, uh, would that be a solution to get people move on more quickly um, if you've got a problem person? A way to look into it, Yeah. What's the relationship between Coamble or Cora, formerly known as Housing New Zealand, and the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development? Because Housing New Zealand has been in Auckland CBD for a long time, and you know, it's, it's almost as if the, the wraparound services have been great, they've always been here, known quantity. In the last two or three years, there's been a plethora of social housing providers, EDL Trust, and, and to name one, but uh, another, that seem to be detached from that traditional housing New Zealand model. And there's a plethora of, I mean, I don't know what the relationship is between the two, the two organisations. And, and they seem to have very different wraparound services, and therefore, um, styles of uh, hierarchy in terms of accountability. Yeah. Where do you go know when there's a problem with the night building? Have things changed substantially? What, what is the new relationship? Yeah, good. So, yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. They're, they're the overarching group. Housing New Zealand's one agency, and then you 
you've got your, your MSD funded housing providers. Right, okay. So we're not associated with them. Ah, thank you. We so the selection criteria of the customer is totally different from them, and they're not going to put it, but more stringent for housing New Zealand. So the housing register is the same, so MSD holds the housing register. So people in a, that contract to MSD pick the same people that we would off the same list. It's the same customer base, but we can't speak to their process. But in terms of our process, I remind you that the start is that you, you do that. So it sounds like it would also be very really useful for us in our office, and we're more than happy to distribute this to everybody who is here tonight. So if you haven't, you know, if you've been invited by somebody else, please make sure that myself or him have your contact details. Again, conscious of time, so we'll continue working through this. All right, just, just briefly, uh, John and Andrew, thank you for, for your contribution. I, I thought that was really useful. Uh, between the two of you, you, you were keen to stress that many of the clients in social housing are people um, who have high needs, and, and, and that is very reasonable. But you didn't mention how many are 501 deportees, how many are recent prison parolees, and how many have gang associations or violent crime offences. And... I'm really guided by the fact that at Thursday afternoon at 1.30 last week, people in business attire in the heart of New Zealand's largest commercial district were being separated by armed gang members by police people with assault rifles. And I think that often some of these people, okay, they, they have needs as well and they need, to be, they need to be catered for, but I wonder how much association they necessarily have with the CBD, whether perhaps if they were uh, based in communities where they can rely upon their own whānau and uh, friend, school, church, uh, marae connections might be a better approach. I think just to um, preface this, when you're talking about 501s in particular, um, we unfortunately don't have a huge amount of control over Australia's deportation, and we have made uh, some substantial <laughs> comments about the way that they have approached that. Uh, but, I mean, this does pertain slightly to where people end up being housed and whether that data is something that... I can't ask that question in terms of how many, but I'm only aware of maybe a couple. Yeah, I Yes, we approach so for example if it's a gang associated or they've come through but we would know or they've come out of prison because they normally come through a prison reintegration service. Um, but but very very few in the, the grand scheme of things would fit that criteria, similar to the, the child sex offenders or even sex offenders. We we have criteria around housing them. They obviously can't be housed anywhere. So we, we do look at that, but again, we're kind of water. We house 450 odd people in the city. There's 4,500 units, and so there, there's other people housing them, but we can't speak to that. But I'd also say that on the 501, that is a substantial issue around particularly folks who are being deported and being up straight on the street. Yeah. Yeah. They also don't have the family support. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're basically Australians by default. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, our, our biggest problem with those from, from Airedale and Lodewater. They seem to be, you know, our most recent issues mainly come from placements by that organisation. And there doesn't seem to be the wraparound support. Yeah, Especially right. after hours, you know, we've got a few long weekends. Yeah. And you've got to wait for the end of the long weekend before you get, you get any response from them. I, I must, and that's a long time for, for neighbouring tenants to have to put up with noise and that. We have, one of our tenants, um, owners, tenants, it's about two hours sleep because they've got people coming and going next door. The doors are right beside one another. People coming and going at one, two, three o'clock in the morning. She's got to get up at five o'clock to go to, to her work or whatever. So she manages to get two hours sleep because she's got a young child who's got to go somewhere too. Sorry. You know, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's the representative of the present I did want to just um, let you know that we as We do have the tougher 
But they need to be screened properly because these units, you know, these right. buildings are not suitable for a lot of these tenants. In a lot of cases, I agree with you. We do also have, have to consider the distribution of the tenants yeah. as well. Yeah. Because we cannot just but you've got to consider the other eight tenants that all live around them, and they're the ones that are right here. Okay, so we've got just 10 minutes left, um, so I just really briefly want to run through, um, so noise control I feel as though we would address, particularly when it comes to council um, and their responsibilities therein. Uh, from the process to urgently remove violent tenants in particular, I mean the police have made it explicit what, what they're able to do here. Uh, wraparound support social services 24 um, hour emergency assistance is very much something um, that, that we evidently need more resource for um, from the top of the pile. When it comes to crime, the most common offences, I guess we're hearing that there is people brandishing weapons in some instances. Drugs, yeah. drugs, 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 drugs and weapons are really drugs. common. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we've got, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just a so I'll just kind of be, just in regards to what everybody's saying, I've been here with all of this for 16 years. Yep. I specialize in the private security, and I've battled it a lot. The thing is, there's a huge growth of drugs going around mm. the city, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't going to stop. It doesn't matter where they move, because I look up to see what doing. Mm. I'm very streetwise. I see them all around. Mm. I know who I am. So it isn't going to go away. So this is the problem that it creates in a lot of the apartment buildings, mm. you see? And it's unstoppable. This is why I can un understand their stress and what they're all going through. Because I've been amongst it. I deal with it. It's my platform. Yeah. And to be honest, it, it, it's really stressful for mm. me and my team of working down. We've had one of my staff, one of my guards has been shot at. I've been bottled twice. Mm. We've had five bike incidents. But for me, I'm not going to go away from it because I feel for the people in the city apartments. Mm. They need our protection. They need our help. Sometimes we don't get the support from agents. Mm. Sometimes I'm not respecting the police, but that's happened to us as well. And we have to deal with it ourselves, mm. you see? So what I'm saying is that because of the great of drugs going around, mm. okay, it's pulling the street up as well. So here's a meeting ground, and I know where they all are, mm. honestly. So it's not gonna go away, but the problem is it's in the buildings. Mm. And you get numbers come in, you see? The tenants observe, they see it, they report it to us. In regards to reporting any issues, I hold all the evidence, CCTV, registrations, identification of the offenders, and so forth, trespass orders, police event numbers, I have it all. To be honest, 100% of that is not really dealt with. Can I ask thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you as well. Can I ask uh, all and you probably, you actually can't, the ISPT tribunal here is because the agents, right, they do not stand up, mm. okay, to speak the truth. Yeah. So Sorry, I was going to ask, you know for a fact that these people are social housing tenants? Because I completely understand. We have a database yeah. system. Okay. Everybody here needs to have a database system with photo ID and all the agents. That's how I know. I have a list of them. Okay, so you it's good for me to know. It's good for me to know. You see, for me and my staff. Like generally speaking, I think from when we when I started living here ten years ago, honestly it's just declined, whether that's resource or whatnot. But um I know actually one of my um, friends, Mum to Cop and she was um trialing the e bikes in town, which I thought was a great idea. Yeah because that would mean police could be on every corner or moving around and get to things quickly. Um, but it just feels like there's no presence. Um, and now the new thing that's happened is now the hostels um, are now, social housing's going into all the hostels, and the hostel owners just don't, not, they don't care what happens to the place because their rooms are all full. So then that is next to an apartment building, and then all of a sudden the crime rates just fly up in the apartment building. Like, within days. Mm -hmm. So it's just about exactly what he's saying about it's the congregation of people. Yeah. If we had more presence of police, mm -hmm. it would be making a stamp of, you know, we're here and we're watching. Mm -hmm. But it just feels like it's a bit empty in here sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Just quickly, to the solution like, and this is just what I said, mm -hmm. I know that you're saying that um, you, you take sort of the top, the top part, the hardest ones to deal with and all that type of stuff. but. And then, then we say, please don't put them in an hour, apartments and all that. Those, those ones, if they were in a house, I'm just saying if they're in a house, 
they, they've got a house and they've got no walls between another apartment or anything like that. And social workers can go there, do, they, if they want to be a bit noisy or whatever, it's not an issue. But, and then they say, oh, but you need to have them where, where their friends, and I've had this issue with, they need to be where their friends are. Their friends are the homeless in town, so they have to be in town. But you don't break a cycle by putting everyone in the same boat again. Mm -hmm. And you need to, a good friend of mine has spoken to me about it, who works at Odyssey House as a counsellor, and he said they need to have incentive to break their cycle as well. And it's no good putting the bed, the ones that are at the highest risk, got the highest social problems and all that, next to, into a building that's a good building with good people. Mm -hmm. They need to be put in a place that almost next to other people, but not with a paper thin wall, in a house that people can go to, can go and assess them, spend time with them. And so it needs to be reversed almost. And the ones that are sort of on hard grounds and can't actually afford something, but have never had a problem socially or mentally or whatever, they should be the ones that are sitting next to all these other people because they will support them. They will They will be sure. Sorry? If I may, um, we only have two minutes left on the clock here, and again, as we said at the outset, the most important thing here, alongside, is getting to these solutions, but we also have to be wary of the fact that everybody's made an hour out of their time on a weeknight to get away from family and otherwise. Uh, so to get to those solutions, uh, and to also make sure that there is a space here where we have points of action, which we will get back to all of you with, but also how does all of this move forward, I think it's really important to note that we are also doing a huge amount of work in the space of homelessness and connecting up a lot of the different agencies there. And a lot of the agencies have done a lot of that work by themselves as well. But you know, when we're talking about something like rough sleeping, uh, that very much has fallen effects into the space of social housing, which in turn has fallen effects into the rental market and otherwise. So it's hugely complex and it does require if we're to deal with it at a structural level to deal with that stuff. So otherwise we're just hoping to get back out onto the street. Um, so what we're hearing, perhaps the loudest and the clearest, is that issue of assessment. And what is that process of assessment? And I think that the way in which everybody is going to feel the most comfortable or a greater sense of control of this is more transparency around how that assessment process occurs, which in turn offers more accountability and the potential to interrogate whether that should be changing. Uh, the second thing is with regard to the kind of enforcement of tenancy standards. And there we have related points around the building manager um, being notified, which was raised earlier, uh, around noise uh, control complaints and where council's at in that. So I'm hearing that they're not coming to the table, uh, but also who the liability sits with and how those contracts are kind of being created. And then the third and final thing is around the prompt and proper response. So this comes, you know, there's a spectrum here, as has been outlined, whether it is the really violent or threat of violent instances. But then we also have people who have perhaps you know, grumblings of issues that continue to wear away, whether it's parties or otherwise at people's sleep, <laughs> uh, but also at, you know, it's effectively antisocial behaviour at the end. Um, and there, you know, we're hearing that the police are good, but perhaps not the uh, best port of call, particularly because it does require that intense wraparound service. Uh, and that's where we've heard that there's a need for more mental health resources and perhaps a better crisis, crisis response. And actually, this is something we've heard out of the uh, kind of clue that we've been holding on how we respond to homelessness around what is that number that you call uh, at three in the morning when people are kicking off on the street. So we can expand that into how do you deal with that when somebody is in the apartment block or otherwise. Because uh, there is some kind of hope there and we've been working with Odyssey House in particular on what that number might be and how we can get direct targeted resources here in the city for that. So that is a plan of attack and its actions for us are things that me and Amber can do from our office. But I guess I wanted to ask, is there anything else that what people think? security? Security and they put a pay for security for these buildings? At the moment, the, the expectation is that the body corporates mm. provide security for the buildings. We have one response, well, somebody else has provided security, why don't you? So I guess That's why the body corporates role. If these people want to put 
these sort of tenants in our buildings, perhaps they should be the paying for security for the buildings also. So that sounds like, again, another great point around debt assessment and mm. also how are people being placed, where they're being placed, but yeah. also that relationship between so the, the tenant person goes and they provide security yeah. for that building. Yeah. So to keep all their friends away, because the friends just follow other people in the building. Okay. So, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah. To, to, to be very quick, like, okay. some owners, and I'm a basic chairman of a building, uh, this bit of media has got an increasing level of incidents that have been reported. But what we've resolved is that some owners don't care. And the only way they'll care is if they get charged a financial penalty for the cost of our good friends up on the side of the To come in there, and they don't have to rough them up. I've just got to stand there, and we find that there's a presence of a noise complaint officer or a security guard, people will move. Mm. We don't have to call the police, but as long as someone from the enforcement comes, there will be a security guard, obviously it escalates a bit different. So that's what I would say. Yes, there are some owners who recover. You know, these people need to be providing that security, that, that security, not providing corporate. No, but so the owners ultimately have to be responsible yes. by my so, for yes. making the assessment of the so this is this is the relationship, and this is what's effectively been identified. Is you've got the tenant, you've got the owner, and then you've got the body corporate mm. company manager at large. A lot of time, the owners is, are overseas. And they, they yeah, really and this is where the unit titles act comes into play. So we have um, the amendment presently in front of the state committee, which I'm on. Um, so that is something which we can seek to do with regard to those relationships and responsibilities when it comes to owners for particularly having a sense of responsibility for the greater community which they brought into when they bought unit types. Um, I'd just like to pose a question to each of the uh, social housing um, groups that are represented here. Um, it was mentioned before about advising building managers of tenants that come in. Do each of you guys, Airedale, um, Kangora and, and the other one likewise, do you advise the building manager of every new tenant you put into an apartment in a building complex? It is part of our process, but we have have missed a few. But actually, we do. We do generally do that. And I think some of the building managers who we work with a lot, where we've done that successfully, realise that actually it's only a very few of our tenants that are causing problems. I think probably where we haven't um, informed the building manager every time, that unfortunately, um, as Nadia Bev said, it's only the ones who cause the problems that then become in most body corporate so, rules, there is a rule that states that you must to, advise right. the building manager. Yeah, yeah. And even, even a lot of owners you try to reinforce that. But, but yeah. this is the point, right? This is the triangular relationship yeah. between the body corporate and the owner and the tenant. Yeah. So I'd, I'd really just like to reinforce that okay. for all of you guys, that's, that's critically important. Whether You're there's right, a bias yeah. against the building manager or not, the building manager needs to know who he's dealing with and who's in the building. Not just mm -hmm. if they're a rat bag. Terrible choice for the building, yeah. but for the, for the safety of everybody else in the building. Thank you. Uh, is this a solution? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. The Unit Titles Act, um, which you're looking at, mandates that there should be body corporate roles. There's no clear mechanism for reinforcement for a body corporate to enforce their rules. So we'd love to see Very you. Yeah, yeah. The RTA. Yeah. Got to join RTA. Yeah. RTA. Yeah. 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 I would encourage you all to watch the finance and expenditure submissions process, which will be broadcast live on Facebook um, as it covers the submissions of the next few weeks. Um, but anyway, just with all of those kind of points of action now put, put out there, uh, we will circulate those in the next day or so, uh, and we will also notify all of you as we get to that point of greater kind of transparency and what those processes are in particular. Uh, Thank you all. So, so, submissions to the UGA close on the 29th? Uh, they already have closed. They close on Friday. Um, no, 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 on the website it's the 29th. Yes, please so. It had better be because we've all got our submissions yep. going. Okay, great. Well, uh, <laughs> so, being, being on the committee, I can ask for them to be late submissions if that is in fact the case. Well, it um, says on, on the website. Okay, great. If you'll follow that up, fantastic. Um, thank you all again, um, and also again, please feel comfortable to, if there's anything that you don't necessarily feel comfortable raising or didn't have time to, feel free to email us and we'll provide all of that in as well, which will end up putting us here. I um, really appreciate it. Right, we'll check out. Yeah, that's what I want to do. We'll check out. 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 We'
Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it.